All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Happy Friday. Um, as we mentioned in the group, uh, I thought that I would introduce one of our superstars at Shift Success. He's a client, a friend of Shift Success, and uh, to add inspiration, add business lessons as, as well. I thought it'd be a good idea to uh, welcome him to the Shift Success podcast live. And he's going to be sharing his journey, what he's been through, and I'm sure uh, plenty of, as I said, lessons and inspiration along the way. So first of all, Mark, welcome. Alex, how are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. Very good. Hey, no problem. No problem at all. Um, so Mark, um, we're going to talk about your journey uh, from police officer to entrepreneur, which I'm really excited to get into. Um, and uh, you can see from the top you're wearing, you are now the founder of the Law Nonagist. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Amazing stuff. So we're going to get into that. And uh, what I'd like to find out, first of all, um, is what were you like as a kid growing up uh, and where were you from? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm an Essex boy. Well, North Essex boy uh, from a, a military town called Culture Store. Though I've got no military connections at all. Um, growing up, I suppose I was a bit of a terror hawk, really. A very energetic child. Um but a troubled soul. I come from a, I had a difficult childhood. I had a difficult childhood in as much as um, mum and dad, a lot of domestic violence, a lot of drinking. Um, and, and I think that kind of reflected itself in my behaviour quite a bit. So I was always keen to please, a bit of a clown. Um, but equally, a very insightful, you know, a very thoughtful child, insightful child. Um, always busy, always doing something, always trying to sell something, build something terrorize someone um but I wasn't a bad egg I was just just troubled I think awesome so you mentioned you know you say your parents they, they were together and you grew up in like where you got brothers and sisters yeah so yeah so mum and dad got divorced when I was about 10 um but the history in their relationship prior to that was, was, was fairly traumatic things really went wrong for mum and dad when I was about about three so my middle brother Aaron was born he was born mentally and physically handicapped mm. and we're talking mid 80s so 1984 I think yep. um yep. and you know the, the technology and, and, and the, the medical advancements that we've got now weren't there um mm. so it was an absolute surprise when Aaron was born that he had um something called microcephalus which is a, a small head and a small brain so it meant that he was mentally and physically handicapped now you, you can imagine that as a, as a family you're expecting um another little life to come into the into the fold and when he is born bless him he's he's deaf he's dumb he's blind um he's mm. got no chance of ever having much of a life really um and 11 months after he was born he died mm. uh, but, but during that time there was a three-year-old me that was a you know hyperactive little monkey um my, my dad was was old school so he didn't cope with things very well and the coping mechanism then was to probably Run, run away from it and hit the bottle and mum mm. was left um with a with a three-year-old and and then a, a baby that was disabled and so the mum had a breakdown as well so those were I guess looking back those were the foundations for um the end of the marriage mum and dad were were two very different personalities my, my dad came from a very tough background his father was Irish he was a heavy drinker um he suffered from what we would now call complex PTSD from the war, which then consequently had an impact on dad and that mm. manifested itself in the marriage. Mum had lived a very sheltered life. She was an only child. Um, and so you can imagine that the, that the connection those two had together was the recipe for a perfect storm. Mm. And very often things would blow up. And of course, once Aaron passed away, that was a big thing. And then, as I say, that was the, the beginning of the, of the marriage crumbling. But they stuck it out for, would have been about seven years. So I was mm. 10 when they broke up. And in that time, we had my, my other brother, Steve, um, who, thank God, was born healthy and, and is fine and, and doing well for himself. Um, but our childhood was traumatic. As I say, there was lots of lots of DV, domestic abuse, lots of drinking. I mean, I can remember I can remember being at home um, as, a, as a kid and, and hearing Dad's key come in the front door. We lived in a bungalow and my bedroom was at the front, so I'd hear his car pull up. I'd hear the front key come in the door and I could tell by how the key was going in the door whether he was pissed or not. Mm. And 
and and I'd be in bed terrified, you know. Um, and then that'd be ten o'clock on a school night, because uh, during this time that you know we're talking sort of mid eighties to to late eighties, the economy was in a bad place. People were being made redundant left, right, and centre. Um, Dad had been made redundant. Money was tight. Dad's way of coping with stress was to drink, um, and arguments were prevalent daily. Um, so I mean, I can remember as a kid being at home and. Uh, hearing his key, you know, coming through the door, and then ten minutes later there'd be arguments and screaming, and and I can remember having to pull my dad off my mum, and then pulling my mum off my dad because she'd cracked him over the head with the heel of her shoe and split his head open, and or he'd chucked her across the room. And at ten years old, you know, you you, you think that's how life is, you think that's normal. Um, and all I was trying to do was kind of split them up and and protect my little brother who was probably two or three at the time by then. And, and things gradually, gradually got worse. Mm. And, and until I suppose at 10 years old, which would have been, I'd have been 1991, mum had had enough and she said, that, that's the end of it. But, and it's strange because I, I can remember looking back and thinking back and even then when I knew my parents were splitting up and, and by far it's the best thing, I didn't want it to happen. I didn't mm. want to be that family, that boy that come from a, a broken family. And I can remember fantasizing about trying to build a brick wall behind my dad's car to stop him from reversing back out the drive so he could stay. Mm. you know um but during those during that time whilst you kind of normalize that the impact and the stress of that environment manifested itself in so many ways i mean it affected my schoolwork. um it gave me a huge inferiority complex um i used to just dick around constantly to try and get some kind of recognition mm. some kind of attention that i wasn't getting at home i used to get crippling headaches almost daily uh, where I end up throwing up and being sent home from school, but that was the last place I wanted to be because I don't want to go home because it was all kicking off at home. I wanted mm. to be at school or I wanted to be with my grandparents. And actually, those, those headaches, whilst the doctors were quite concerned, was just my little body couldn't cope with the pressure and the stress of being at home. It was just how that stress manifested itself. So as soon as mum and dad split up, the headaches and the, and the symptoms I was showing disappeared. Mm. Um, so it was a really... It was a really tough time. It was a really tough time up until about 10 years old. And then, of course, there was the divorce. And then we had no money. Mm. We had no money. And I just started secondary school then. And, you know, I had to get two paper rounds because I wanted to try and keep up with my mates, you know, the families that were still together. And they were going on holiday and they were doing things and riding bikes. And, and I kind of, we had no car. You know, I used to see my dad once a week. And... Mm twice a week and um he was he reluctantly paid child maintenance but not enough mm. you know and that made things harder for mum who was working part-time so she had an 11 year old 11 year old me and my brother was six so we relied an awful lot on my grandparents to, to help us out and and I think that's kind of where my as a youngster this inferiority complex I had came mm. out because I was just mm. trying to be normal what I thought was normal I was, I was embarrassed by my background um mm. I was embarrassed we had no money and uh you know when you get to secondary school and things start happening and changing within your body and in your social circles you become very self-conscious mm. um and yeah I I, I suppose I, I developed this kind of alter ego where I wanted to be a clown I wanted to muck around I was constantly dicking around at school mm. Um, I used to do ridiculous things. I can remember. I remember once um, because I used to love the attention. I used to love the fact that I could make a class laugh, and I used to love standing up and being cheeky and doing silly things that sometimes would even make the teachers laugh. You know, <laughs> and I can remember once. Um, I never I, after about the age of thirteen, I was hit by a car, so that prevented me from doing PE for quite a while. I was involved in a hit and run accident, and so I used to sit on the sidelines in the school gym. And watch everyone play badminton and do this, that, and the other. I used to get bored, senseless. So the obvious thing for Mark Walsh to do was act like a tit and, and play around. Mm. I discovered that behind the crash mats was uh, the power box of the school. I could turn the power off to the school. So I, I wiggled in between these two crash mats and switched the whole power box, then shut down the kitchen, shut down everything, set the alarms off, and, and I couldn't get out again. <laughs> so I, got, I got suspended for that. Um, I, I used to somehow manage to hide in the cavity between the two floors of the of the main building and make stupid noise. I was just a pain in the bum. Mm. Um, but I still love the attention. Mm. And and I also, because I was aware of we didn't have a lot of money, I was embarrassed that I was going 
to get my lunch with my dinner tickets and the dinner ticket queue with my circle of friends and cash. Mm. You know, I, was, I was a very driven lad as well. It made me want to go and earn money. And then mm. so my, my little entrepreneurial streaks started. Um, and uh, yeah, I got a job on a, on a farm and I, and I absolutely loved that. I was about 13 and my friend Liam and I, we went used to go down there and, and muck out the pigs and the farmers let us drive the tractors and he'd give us a tenner for a week or something, which was perfect for us. You know, that would that buy us some crisps and some Coke and packet of fags maybe between us, you know, and, and that was that, they were really good days. But what it did is it gave us a work ethic, mm. work ethic to think, well, actually, the harder I work, the more I can earn. So then at the age of about 14, as well as having these two paper rounds, so I had a paper round from a Monday to a Saturday, and then I had a Sunday paper round. I got a job washing up in a local restaurant. Mm. Um, so I was doing all hours of God's time, but I was earning 60, 70 quid a week um, as, a, as a 14 year old back in 1995. And all of a sudden I had money. I was buying bikes, I had clothes, I had, you know, I, I was taking cash to school and, and buying my lunch with my money. You know, and I was wearing all that back then. It was all like the eclipse gear and the spliffy gear. And I was able to buy myself like these t-shirts, and and I had this ridiculous little spliffy waistcoat that I'm dreadfully embarrassed about now. But that was my my pride and joy, and baggy jeans that would even be too big for me now. You know, but yeah. that, that that's when I then realised that I started to get this work ethic. Where I thought, well, depending on how much you put in, it's very reflective of how much you get out. Mm. And and I, yeah, I was so I started washing up. And then the head chef there said to me, well, what do you want to do when you leave school? And I thought, well, I don't want to be a chef. It's a good idea, be a chef. Because I quite, I quite liked the energy in the kitchen. It kind of suited me. I was quite hyperactive. And I liked the loudness. I liked the fact that people were shouting and swearing and chucking things. And it was a really busy kitchen, mm. really busy kitchen. And, and it, Tim Martin, a good friend of mine to this day, ex-army chef, had worked in Selfridges, had worked in all these hotels in London. I said, do, do you know, do you want an apprenticeship? I was like, yeah, brilliant. I'll do that then. I'm going to be a chef. So there, there I turned up after I left school and this really big baggy chef's jacket with this little neckerchief that looked ridiculous and my little hat on. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my first day as a full-time chef, and I'd done a bit part-time, first day as a full-time chef as a 16-year-old, I got sacked um, <laughs> because I tried to slice some cucumber on a slicer machine and slice the tips of my fingers off. Oof. So... Yeah, I, nothing too bad, but I didn't need any reconstructive surgery, but we had to chuck the cucumber away because my fingertips are in it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think I've been in full-time employment for about four hours and I got sacked again for being reckless. <laughs> my, my, my boss back then, he was a bit of a dragon. And I kind of had to go, <laughs> to go back to work the next day with my hand bandaged up to beg for my positions as commie chef, man. But, so I got it back and, and I kind of made a, a, a mental commitment really to... So now I'm, I'm going to prove myself. I'd spent the best part of 10 years dicking around and I've kind of got this reputation of being a bit of a, a bit of a boy and a bit of pain in the bum and a bit of a joker. I thought now, now's time for me to start getting serious. I've got to really apply myself. And I actually fell in love with cookery. Mm. I really fell in love with cookery. So the restaurant I was working in was, this was before the days of gastro pubs and everything. It was the busiest place in Colchester. We would do 200 and, 50 covers on a Saturday night. It was right. busy. And, and it was kind of before the, the catering and the cookery thing got really fashionable. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I applied myself and I started to work up the ranks. And by 19, I was head chef of the place. Wow, and 19. I was earning good, good money. And I was, I was running the show. I was making them money. But I only knew what I knew there. So whilst I was really efficient and running a team, and you know, I had chefs that were double my age underneath me mm. um i only knew what i knew there i didn't know anything beyond that and it's it's like that saying you just don't know what you don't know do you so mm -hmm. it very quickly became obvious that i could stay in that position and earn good money for my age and uh, you know get the nice alloy wheels on my car and look really cool and you know to the waitresses because i'm a young head chef or I could develop myself because I'm already, I was starting to feel caged and hemmed in. And I wanted to, I had this yearning for knowledge and this, this kind of thirst to learn more and to be more. 
So I left um, and I went to a far better hotel as a trainee chef again. So I kind of took a pay cut. It was back then would have been about 300 pound a month pay cut. Mm-hmm. Go back to a, a, a commie chef level or chef de party level, which is quite low down in the ranks um, to learn more. I ended up in this um, Italian hotel, Italian run hotel in a little village called Coggeshaw, a place called the White Hart Hotel. And back then, that was a really good place to go. Everything was homemade. We used to make everything, our ice creams, our pasta, our biscuits mm-hmm. and cheese. Everything was made. And I, I absolutely fell in love with that place. Um, I was learning to fillet fish and to butcher meat properly. I wasn't just buying it from the butcher. I was buying meat and I was butchering it. And, and then um, I went there and I worked hard and I got my head down. And then within six months, I was second chef at that hotel. Um, so I'd kind of skipped a few ranks and got up to second chef. And that restaurant had two rosettes. So it was an award-winning restaurant. Um, and by that time, things were going really well for me. I had the car I wanted. I had a, I just passed my bike test. I had a lovely sports bike, motorcycle, and felt like I'd made it. But then that, that feeling of stagnation come back again. Hmm. Um, and I managed to somehow bag myself a job in London at a hotel. Well, I say North, it's not really London, actually. It's, it's more sort of North London. It was a hotel. It was still there now, with Hanbury Manor Hotel. And back then, it was a five-star hotel. It was converted uh, nuns convent. Massive place. Three-star restaurant at one side of the hotel, a two-star restaurant at the other side of the hotel. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to go and better myself again. So I took another pay cut, went back down to... a uh, first commie rank again so that's back down the chain to go and learn more to go and learn from these guys and man, that was a different world that was a different world i lasted about three weeks and walked out it was just too much for me <laughs> at that age um yeah. I, I remember one day i was it was it was relentless and there was a head chef a french guy who had just come from the dorchester and he was a absolute taskmaster he hated me and to be frank i hated him as well um and he treated the staff terribly i remember one day i just hadn't slept i hadn't had anything to eat the sunroof of my car was leaking i remember thinking yeah i got this i'm going home so i packed up my car again and just drove back home again and went back to the white Hart hotel back as second chef because they couldn't replace me mm-hmm. and and it's good that i did because that's where i met my wife so i was 21 by then 20 21 and lauren my wife had just finished uni and she'd started as a as a waitress um and we, we got on like a house on fire. So I wow. had to buck my ideas up and went on a mission to prove myself again, but prove myself to her that I wasn't the dick that I appeared to be. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and so, and so we got together and, and, and then the same thing happened again. I decided then that I was getting stagnant and I wanted to go to another restaurant, another kitchen to, to better myself. Mm-hmm. So I went to another hotel and went down as a, as a chef chef to party, uh, got promoted again to a sous chef, but it was getting difficult because Lauren and I were getting quite serious then and we were living together. Mm. Um, and in catering, the, the hours are relentless. Um, and I um, I was only having two days off a week. And in them two days, I was really into my martial arts then. So I was doing taekwondo those two days a week and the relationship was really starting to suffer. So I decided that I had to either kind of do what I wanted to do, or did I want to keep this this lady happy that I thought an awful lot of? So I decided to jack catering in, and right. I went into sales. Went into sales. Went into food sales. Food sales. Yeah. Food sales. So I figured that I could use um, my background as a chef, my understanding, my knowledge, and I could go and sell food. How hard could it? How hard could it be? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how hard can it be? So, I went through an agency and I got this job with a company called KFF that's still going now. Uh, they're, they're a far bigger concern now than they were back in 2004, 2005. And um, a lady called Karen interviewed me and she was a sales manager. And she said to me, she goes, have you, have you done sales before? I said, no, never, never done sales. Um, but she goes, I like you. She goes, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a job. She goes, I'm going to give you 22,000 years of basic. Mm-hmm. And she said, you can have a company car. She goes, she goes, would you like the job? I went, yeah, yeah, it sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> goes, be working in central London. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the caveat. I've only been to London once before. <laughs> yeah. 
So the next thing I know, I'm going to this training. Now, there I am in London with an A to Z in one hand and a, 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 a briefcase in the other, going to hotels and knocking on doors and, and learning to, to cold call and prospect and sell. Mm-hmm. And that was the best training ground I've ever had in sales. The best by a long shot. Why? You, you very quickly learn about hostility, rejection, and you very quickly learn how to say the right things at the right time to the right people. Mm. And once I'd cracked that, there was no stopping me because the, the carrot that was dangled in front of me was that if you hit target, if you hit margin target, um, you get two and a half thousand pounds per quarter. And so that was it. That's all I needed to know. I can earn money here. Yeah. And, and off I went. And then within the year, I was their top salesman out of 20 reps. Wow. Uh, some real seasoned guys there. So at 24, um, I was earning back then 40,000 a year. Nice company car. I kept getting company cars. I was getting promoted. Um, and I'd, I'd really just learned to cut my teeth by beating the streets and knocking on doors. And I was so green and so blase that I was just canvassing everything. I mean, mm. I was going to places like the Savoy and, and really getting told where to go. Uh, <laughs> no one wanted to buy my baked beans in the Savoy, you know. <laughs> But um, I, I managed to get involved in that launching uh, with another development chef, this upmarket range called Excellence, mm-hmm. where we were then getting some really upmarket products, really nice cheeses, um, caviar, really nice charcuterie. And then I was able to show my wares as a chef to the company. And I then become the company chef as well. Mm. And then I was writing menus for pub groups and costing them out. And all of a sudden, I made myself almost indispensable to that firm. Mm. And I was with them for eight years. Um, eight. eight years. And then that feeling of stagnation came again. Which think that, because there's, there's a common theme here. There's, there's a common theme of, uh, I've kind of nailed this, now I want to move on. Yeah. Where does you think that comes from? I think it's, I, I, do you know what, Alex? I think it stems back to that in, that inferiority complex I had as a kid where I feel like I need to prove myself again. I practice, it's normalized. Mm. I need to challenge. I need to prove my, prove to myself that I'm better mm. than I thought I was. Mm. And, I, and I think if I'm, if I'm brutally honest with myself, it's that fear, that childhood fear of not being enough, mm. not being, not being enough, not being top of the pile. Mm. Now, actually, as I've gone in life, that that's backfired on me and, probably come to that a bit later on but mm-hmm. you can very when you're like that you can very quickly burn out mm. um but at the time i was then 29 i had two kids i was on top of the world and actually i i've just taken part in a um i've taken part on a tv show as well actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i don't yeah. think i've told you this have i no. um i somehow i got myself on a series called breaking into tesco um uh, which was a it's a bit like an X Factor for chefs back then. It was 2007, 2008. Mm. And I'd, um, I was going into London to work and I'd seen this advert in the Metro. Yeah, it is the Metro, the paper. And, and it said, are you a chef? Have you got a good idea that you think would sell? We'd love to hear from you. So I got my, had a Blackberry, work black, so I emailed them and said, Look, hi, my name's Mark. I'm a chef. I've got loads of funky ideas. If you want to know more, get in contact. Yeah. Well, then, then the researcher phoned me up. She said, brilliant. She goes, what's your idea? She goes, we're really interested. She goes, what, what recipe would you like to submit? And I'm thinking, shit, I haven't, I haven't got a recipe. Yeah. So on the spot, I said, I'm going to do a local hog and apple pie with local cider and herbs. And she was brilliant. She goes, we'll get back to you. So the next thing I got an email saying, we'd like to invite you for an audition. Can you bring your dish with you? Wow. I didn't need it. I didn't even know what I was doing. So I, that weekend, I was at home. Anyway, I made this, this, this pie. Um, and it was, it was pretty good to be fair. So I've done the audition and me being me played up to the camera, acted like a bit of a Muppet got on the show. Never in a million years, did I expect to get to the final, but I did and I'll come, come second. Wow. Um, but it was after that, it was the come down after that, right? I kind of felt that I was going somewhere. I was, I was getting interviews from the, I had an interview with the daily mail. I had people around my house at the radio. I was being asked to open local shows. Mm-hmm. But suddenly, I was like this this celebrity because of this blinking pie that I'd made, um, a local celebrity, and and then it just stopped. Mm. Uh, Why did it stop? Just because it just phased out, or it stopped? It just stopped. The I 
so the person that won the show, they got us a contract with Tesco for that to be stocked in national stores. Mm. Come second place, you didn't get anything. I did have a few phone calls from some other large supermarkets um, that said they were really interested in, in what you've done. But once they, we had a meeting, they realised, actually, I'm not a production line. I'm just this, <laughs> this, this bloke from Essex <laughs> yeah. in, in rolling out pastry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, kind, that kind of stopped. So then I started to make them and sell them to start to make these pies and sell them to farm shops. Because at that point, farmers markets were really sort of in and farm shops were popping up everywhere. And they were selling like hot cakes or hot pies. I couldn't keep up. Mm. Um, and it was, so I was working in my sales job. And at that time, I'd kind of cracked that job to the point where I didn't really have to work too hard for it. I was hitting target and it was just happening. Um, and I was making money. So it wasn't hard, it wasn't hard work for me then. Mm -hmm as it was for some other people, I'd, I'd kind of got the ball rolling. It was, the momentum was going, it was taking care of itself. But I was burning, burning myself out again. I had, I had two young kids. I'm making pies at the weekend. I'm doing a thousand miles a week in my car during the week. I'm trying to please everyone. Mm. Um, and there I am at five in the morning on a Sunday morning with my son in like a strapped to my chest and like a carry thing, rolling out pastry, you know. And um, Gradually the sale dropped off the, the, the interest wanes and it does these, these things are always like flash in the pan aren't they um mm. and i was kind of just left with my sales job but i felt so stagnated uh, and, and that's then when the idea of joining the police got into my mind yeah why why, why the police so you've gone from being a, a chef to to then going into sales and then you know why the police that is so yeah related in any way <laughs> it's totally unrelated, isn't it? Yeah. And given my background as a kid, when, I, when people found out I joined the job, they, they, you could see the shock in their face. You see the colour drain from their face. How on earth did you get into the police? Yeah. Uh, so I always had a healthy respect for the police. Always mm -hmm. did. And, you know, I, that came from, I can remember the one incident it came from was as a youngster before mum and dad split up, um, we had a bungalow, we had a long garden. Our garden used to back on to another garden. So two gardens back onto each other. And I was in the garden one day as a kid and I saw someone climbing a ladder and getting into the window of the bedroom of the house behind us. Mm. So I went back and said, mum, there's someone breaking into the house. And, and so mum then phoned the police and I got my BMX and went up the road to have a look. Yeah. Just as the policeman pulled into the road where the house was and he jumped out, lights blaring, jumped out, and he sprinted to this house. And I can remember he had hold of his, had a wooden truncheon and he was on his radio and it just looked so brilliant. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. And it tur turns out, that actually it was the bloke that lived in the house and locked himself out. <laughs> 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 but, but nevertheless, I was just kind of in love with this whole kind of fast car sirens and lights. And, and I just, as like that, that kind of, made me fall in love with the police. Um, mm. So despite the fact that I was a, a little terrible growing up, I had a real healthy respect for the police. I just never felt like I was good enough. Mm. So I always felt like, I always put the police and police officers on this pedestal that were, the, you know, they were the, they were what society was all about. These, these are the people that, that, they're the knowledge, they're the power, they're, as, in, in, you know, as a kid, when, when the policeman used to come into the school and, forget his name, but he used to come in regularly and talk to us, the local beat officer. I used to sit there in awe looking at him, almost in love with him. You know, I would look at his handcuffs and his truncheon and stuff. And so I suppose that sort of triggered this subconscious yearning to, to be a copper. Mm. Um, so I got to 29, sort of fast forward back to, back to them days. And um, I thought, what the heck, I'm going to give it a go. I had this yearning then. I felt stagnant again. I had this yearning to learn something new, to do something new. Mm -hmm. And being the driven individual that I am, I thought, why not? I'm going to have a go. So I went to, it was 2008, and I went to the Metropolitan Police um, recruitment drive on Chinese New Year at Trafalgar Square. And it was rammed, rammed. But I thought, no, I want to go. So I went and I did my little, um, I think we played with a PC, took some details off me, and they lost my application. So I had to do it again. And next time I know, I'm being invited for, a, for an assessment centre. Um, so all of a sudden shit's getting real, you know, all of a sudden I'm kind of, I could be, I could be joining the police. <laughs> How can Mark Walsh be joining the police? 
Um, and I had absolutely no idea what I was letting myself in for, none at all. Um, and I remember every night I'd finish work, I'd go home and I'd rehearse the core competencies. I'd write them down every night, the yeah. core competencies and, and what they meant. And they were so ingrained in my brain. And I'd get onto um, different police forums, um, UK police, UK, UK police, I think, forum or something, and just be asking questions left, right, and centre, and gradually building up my knowledge and understanding of what the job entails. So yeah. um, I went down my assessment centre in Hendon. Mm -hmm. And fine, did the role play, it was fine. Um, all went well. A few weeks later, I got a letter saying, congratulations, we're inviting you to join the police. Wow. Uh, I've done, done my fitness by then. Um, but then this, this is right on the cusp of the austerity measures. So there I am, and I'm thinking, boom, I'm in. I'm in the job. Mm. There's going to be a copper in London. Fan fantastic. Because at that point, I knew London well. I, I'd spent the last eight years working in London. Yeah, sales. Um, and for me, it's just, I've been watching the city of London police going on their motorbikes and watching Metpole turning up and dealing with incidents. And and I, as, as a 29-year-old man, I used to stand there and fantasize about being a police, just watching these, these men and women on horseback and in car, flying around on blues and thinking, that's amazing. Here yeah. I am selling frozen chips and baked beans. Well, I could be doing that. Yeah. And um, it was a real aspiration, a real aspiration. So... My start date got cancelled. We're on the cusp of austerity. I'm getting geared up to go. And then I get a letter from, from Metpole saying, sorry, your application is going on hold. And um, we'll let you know as and when it happens. But at this point, in my mind, I was already, I'd already finished in sales. Yeah, because transitioning. Every, so come. every day was a struggle. Mm. To go and knock on a door, to go, and, to go and bag a job. Yeah. It was, whereas before it was a breeze. Yes. It was a struggle. And mine had already gone. I'd gone. Yeah, I to I totally gone. Um, so I get home one day, and I thought, well, I can transfer my assessment centre results. So I Suffolk Constabulary, which was I thought I live in Essex, but I live on, in North Essex. I'm right on the cusp of Suffolk. Suffolk Constabulary were um, were accepting transferry probations, or they'd accept certainly accept um, my assessment centre results. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think Suffolk had a higher pass mark than the Met. They did. I, I would just scrape through as so I got in. And I had a final interview and I passed that and got offered a start provisional start date. And then a couple of months later, cancelled. Wow. So I'm like, this is just not meant to be. But, in, but it was getting harder and harder to motivate myself to get in that car and drive into London or to get on the train and go and see yeah. customers and to go and do my account management. To go and, and, and actually my prospect numbers just dropped right off because I mm. just thought I was done. I'd yeah. go into London on the train and as long as my figures looked right, I'd just go and walk around St Paul's Cathedral and get a coffee somewhere and then go home again. Yeah. That, that's how gone I was. And, and sales can do that. Sales can burn you out quite quickly as well. Mm -hmm. Especially when you when you go at things at 120 mile an hour, like I have a habit of doing. Yeah. Um, so I decided that by then I was 30, 29, 30. I had two kids and I thought, well, I'm going to join the special. So I did. Um, and loved it. And a year later, Suffolk said, off you go, start we're, date. We're ready. And that was it. Off I went, training school, in my uniform, and felt like I'd made it. Absolutely amazing. So you've so you've been, a, well, was a cop for 10 years. Yeah. When your first couple of years or your first, you know, five years, were you still in love with it, as you would say? or Absolutely job pissed. Loved yeah. it lived and breathed it mm -hmm. um you couldn't get me to leave the station after a night shift i'd be mm -hmm. too busy having a laugh with the day shift day turn i was just absolutely i just felt like i was slotted right in i yeah. i felt like i was part of something big and something meaningful i felt like i'd really achieved and it is an achievement to get into the police mm -hmm. you know it is an achievement i really felt like now it was my bad but uh, you know, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but in in being so in love with the police, meant that I didn't have enough, maybe enough space, mental space, more for the family that I should have done. Mm. You know? And so that you was focused so much on your your jobs in the police that you maybe yeah. checked out mentally when you was at home with the family. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And uh, it, it, I'm, I'm more mature now. I'm, I'm more experienced now. And looking back, it's something that. I feel terrible about. I mean, 
it breaks my heart to think of some of the things. I can remember once after a night shift, um, laying on the sofa, and we, uh, we were in a house then that had quite a long, stony drive. And my little boy, Joshua, he was two at the time, he's coming back from preschool. And him and Max, who was four, were, my two boys were walking up the drive. And, and then all of a sudden, they went, shh, we, we've got to play quietly because daddy's asleep. And that always sticks with me that the, the, the job had had that much of an impact on me, it impacted my children. Mm. You know, they felt like they, they couldn't play loudly. They couldn't be little boys. Um, and actually, so I was about three years into the job mm -hmm. uh, and things weren't great at home. I, I wouldn't say the marriage was on the rocks, mm -hmm. but that Lauren was struggling. You know, mm -hmm. we did a lot of money. So again, I've done my usual, taking a pay cut to develop myself. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing 60, 70 hours a week. I was doing night shifts. I was always tired. I wasn't about. All of a sudden, the weekends we had as a family, they weren't there. Mm. Um, and there I was having an absolute jolly, going around nicking people and driving around on blue lights. Actually, my little family were at home, missing me um, and missing out on me as well. Mm. So I left. I left the place. Um, what? For, after three years. After three years? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so, so let's, let's pause there. So... When I was doing research in shift success, I, I discovered that a lot of there's a very, very high divorce rate with police officers. Mm. Um, you've been married now 20, 21 years. No, I've been, been, my, been my wife 21 years, I've been married eight years. Okay, so it's 21 years, for 12 years, 21 year relationship. Yeah, um, what do you think? There's two kind of two questions. First of all, what kept you together when you know you was going through that hard time when you was a police officer and also what's kept you together up until this day because because you know i think in today's day and age i've just proposed to my partner i yeah. want to get lessons from you on what makes a successful relationship because i'm not where you are i've not got a 21 year relationship um, no. and i want to you know be successful um, in that area um i mean we, we we love each other very deeply lauren and i and we we've we've grown together and we've we have, I mean, anybody in any relationship, they have ups and downs. And I think it's how you cope and deal with them ups and downs. And we, we, we're a very, I'd like to think, and she, she may disagree, but I think we've got a very, very strong foundation, a very healthy relationship. We also share children. So mm -hmm. when, when things do get tough, and they do, and they will, for everyone, because it happens, it's life. You know, life has a habit of throwing some absolute curveballs, as we both know. Um, you have to remind yourself of the responsibilities you have as parents. Mm. And, and I will say that actually the experiences that I had, in fact, this is very pertinent, actually, the experiences that I had as a child with the DV, with the drunkenness, with the arguments, um, they, uh, there's some good come out of that in as much as I would never let my children experience that. Mm. Ever. And Lauren had similar experiences as well as a kid in a, in a different guise, but her parents split up. So and what was it there then, Mark? So, cause there's a common theme with parents, like your granddad mm. had, had issues that your dad had then issues. Mm. Why did it stop with you? Why, why were you the change in your family tree? Because I took ownership. Mm. Responsibility. Because I took ownership because ultimately, you know, as a child, I was, I was still, we, my brother and I, we were still suffering the after effects of World War II. Mm. If, you, if, you, if you trace it back to granddad come back from the war, a different man, he was on the D-Day land as my granddad was. He watched his mates being shredded in half with bullets. Mm. Enough to mess anybody up. Yeah. Got a shell shock, went back out to the war again mm. once, once he felt good enough. But then all that baggage come back home again, just as my dad was being born. Mm. Granddad was a drinker, granddad was a violent man. Mm. My granddad was still thumping people in his 80s. He mm. was, as soon as he got a drink inside him, the, the village he lived in, small, lovely little village in Constable Country, the locals used to steer clear of him. The family had a terrible name because as soon as you upset Bill Walsh, you were flattened. Mm. Um, and of course, my dad adopted that because it was learnt behaviour. Mm. Um, and dad had a terrible childhood. I mean, I, I, I like to think now, now I'm probably as an adult and a father myself and I'm, I'm a lot more insightful, insightful and certainly the last couple of years that I think my dad did the best he could with the tools he was given. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I probably, I might have made him out to be a bit of a, an ass here, but he wasn't. 
you have empathy in the fact that he had a hard childhood, hence why his behaviours were the it, way they were. Exactly that. Yeah. There, there was a very loving side to my dad, a very generous side, a very knowledgeable academic side to my father, but he couldn't, he couldn't cope with himself. Mm. And I always used to live in fear of my dad mm. um, until one day, and it was just after we had children, dad and I had a big row and embarrassed. I, I lost my shit with him and he had a few home truths. And I could see that as I had these years of pent up issues, they started to seep out. I could see that oh, I could almost see him driving through his heart, you know, and yeah. had to come out. Yeah. Had to come out. But then the roles changed in our relationship. All of a sudden, I was a man. Mm, yeah. And I'm not someone that I wasn't, I've never been someone that can be pushed around or, you know, I've never been a shrinking violet. Mm. But the relationship pivoted and the balance, the weight changed a little bit. Mm. And it was then I, I thought I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to allow my children to witness and live through what I went through. Yeah. So I took responsibility for it all. I like to think without sounding too arrogant. Yeah. Put a stop to it there and then. Amazing. So, so going back to your relationship with Lauren. Yes. You know, what do you, what do you feel you, the responsibility of being parents kept you together? Um, you're obviously deeply in love. Is there anything else that you think has kept you together this long? Because I think it's amazing that, you know, 20 plus years. We're best friends. We, we, we've matured together. I mean, we were 20, I was 21. Lauren was 23 when we got together. And so we're still very young. And we were living together within three months because Lauren had <laughs> Lauren had come back from university and fallen out with her stepmom and, and had gone to rent a flat in Colchester and she was going to have a friend from London moving with her, but a friend dropped out. So Lauren was then stuck with a flat that she couldn't really afford on her own. I was the new boyfriend. So by default, mm. we ended up renting together. Mm. Uh, and over the years, we've, we've matured together. We are so close. We, mm. We're like best friends. And I, I, don't know what, I don't know what the secret formula is, really. I, I think just... I think you just need to respect each other. Mm. Do you think you've grown together? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, if you ask Lauren now, I think the experience of the last few years, I'm a different man to what I was five years ago, and from there, a different man to what I was five years before that. Mm. Um, and Lauren's a very, Lauren's a very steady, stoic type of person. I'm very much an energetic. If something needs to be done, do it now. Get on with it. Get yeah. shit done. Type yeah. Of person. Yeah. And that's almost like a good blend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She she needs me to cheer up sometimes and I need her to pull me back sometimes. I and like we can in the middle a little bit. I like yes. it. Mm. I love it. I, know, I appreciate your thoughts on that. It's, it's interesting to know. Um, so going back, obviously, you have the deso- uh, decision um, and you end up, well, decision between your family and the police. Yes. Three, year, three years in, you decide to leave. Yes. What happens next? It was a, a terrible, terrible, terrible time for me. Um, mm. So I didn't want to leave the place, mm. but I, I knew I was having, it was almost like this debate in my head daily, you know, your heart and your head. My heart is my family. I've got to be the, be the best I can be for my family. My head is, well, this is your dream and you're walking away from it. You, you dreamed of being a police officer and you walked away from it. Mm. And, and actually I, I went into a deep depression. I the, the day I, put my um get my warrant card back um i've gone and secured a job back in food sales for another for another company um and i thought i'll just go back and, and do with them what i did with mm-hmm. for that company. i got home that evening and i just burst into tears on the sofa i just felt i felt like part of me had died mm-hmm. the, the, I, I was so in love with the job mm-hmm. i was so proud of what i did for a living it was such an achievement for a lad that had come from nothing from a lad that had, could have been nicked so many times and got away with it, for a lad that was a, a little bugger at times, you know, to be a police officer, to feel like I'd achieved something, feel like I'd arrived. Do you think it became your identity? 100%. 100%. Mm. 100%. The biggest mistake I made ever was to let that job be my identity. Mm. Um, and I felt like that. Now, I'd made the decision for the right reasons. 
of course and yeah because i cared deeply about lauren i cared deeply about my two boys we didn't have ruby then my, my two boys um and i wanted to give them the best of me but in doing so i had to give part of me away now what i didn't account for was that when i did that it was going to totally mess me up mm. because i felt like all of a sudden i remember thinking i remember thinking this so on my my, my last day i went to a sudden death mm. where a lady bit where um a body had been found outside mm -hmm. of an elderly lady and of course when you go to something like that you it's a very sensitive subject, but you do feel like you're the person that take responsibility. You're acting as a coroner's officer. You know, you're kind of, you're doing the necessary checks that you need to do to make sure it's all kind of tight, I suppose. You make sure there's no, no scene needs to go on. There's nothing suspicious. I was important. Mm. I was an important person because I was, I was a police officer. I was dealing with someone's, some poor person's body, but mm. also family that, were, that had the, the shock of their lives were finding grandma in the garden. Mm -hmm. um, and then two days later the, that was on the Friday on the Monday there I am selling baked beans to a restaurant again mm. spoken down to by a, a grumpy little pips week of a chef mm. I'm thinking do you have no idea what I was doing do you know who I am do you know what I've done you mm. know and that's kind of how my my, my, my psyche was um, and I really struggled to swallow that pill and I would probably that's probably my first experience of mental health problems Mm. that I was stressed and I got diagnosed with depression. So mm -hmm. now with that company, with Holdsworth was the company, mm -hmm. the largest independent food wholesaler in the UK, it was back then. And I set up, uh, I picked up a territory in Essex. And so despite the fact that I didn't want to be there, I didn't really want to be doing it, I missed the police dreadfully. I pined for it every day. I went out and I went selling, which comes came naturally to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I picked up a ledger that was probably worth about eight grand a week. Mm -hmm. And I was with Holdsworth for nine months and I got it doing 40 grand a week um, and become their top salesman um, or one of their top salesmen. And then a KFF come back and headhunted me back. Mm. They headhunted me back. And I kind of, because I was feeling so out of sorts in my mind then i thought well it makes sense to go back to my comfort blanket that's where yeah yeah, yeah. To develop. that's they know me there mm -hmm. and, and i went back so i told the sales director at holdsworth that i'm coming to kff and, and understandably he had the right up because um I, I turned this they had a new depot in essex and i was i was funding the depot i was bringing business in and they, mm -hmm. um and i was off to a competitor mm -hmm. so he he stuck me on garden leave Mm. so i had a month off and it was then that probably one of the most most worst experiences of my life ever took place it was a sunday afternoon and i was out on a bike ride with lauren and the boys and i got a phone call from my uncle roy my dad's brother he said he said i remember mark um it's roy i said your uncle roy he said that yeah no he said your dad's been in a fight he's got to go to hospital and uh he said, can you come up to Dedham, please? Dedham. Wait, I said, oh. and in my mind, I thought, bloody bloke. He's gone and got pissed up and he's gone and hit someone. Yeah. Um, and I was fuming, absolutely fuming. So I said to Lars, I said, oh, look, I'm going to go home and get in the car and go see what dad's up to. He's probably got, a, I was expecting a busted nose or something. It was a week after his 65th birthday. Yeah. And, and I'd seen him the week before. We had dinner together and we had a lovely time and, because by that time, mum and dad were best friends, believe it or not. All, all the differences are gone, and my parents grew to be best friends again. Yeah. Um, and we had a big family dinner um, with, with, with some of dad's friends, and it was lovely. But I, I always knew that dad had this thing with drink, and when he had a drink, that he'd been us. It was kind of ingrained in him. And I just assumed, wrongly, that he had um, had a drink and, uh, and got on a scrap. Yeah. So I get... I'm on a bike and I'm cycling back to the fields. My phone goes again. It's my Uncle Roy. He said, Mark, he said, don't come here. He said, can you go to Adam Brooks Hospital? Your dad's going to hospital in a helicopter. Oh, wow. And now I know from experience, if you're going to hospital in an air ambulance, that's life changing, life threatening. Yeah. yeah. Turns out that, um, that dad has gotten some sort of altercation at the back of the house where he was living with uh, a local alcoholic that had mental health issues. 
and the bloke's hit dad and dad has fallen back and hit his head on the curb and end up with a fractured skull mm. blood clot on the brain and was in a coma so i pick up my mum and my brother and we then fly off to adam fly off, drive off to adam Brooks. Yeah. yeah and whilst i'm on whilst i'm driving down the m11 i must be in excess of 100 mile now i just driving like I was on a grey day. Um, phone come, the, the phone rings, Adam Brooks Hospital. Um, it's a surgeon. He said, listen, he said, your dad needs emergency surgery to save his life. Um, what I need to know is, is, has he got any allergies? Has he got any medical conditions? Because as soon as that helicopter lands, I'm, he's going straight into surgery. Mm. I'm, like, I, I'm driving. I'm thinking, fucking hell, what, what is going on here? You know? So I... I I blab out what I think he's got and what he hasn't got. And, and by the time I get to Adam Brooks, I'm met by two police officers. I'm marched up to the, um, the uh, ICU, uh, NCU, Neurological Intensive Care Unit. Yeah. Um, and dad's in surgery. Um, and, the doctor, and they're sort of saying, you know, it's, it's not good. We don't know if dad's going to make it. He's got brain damage. Mm. Um, he's... Severe swelling on the brain. Mm. Um, he's got severe swelling on the brain. Mm. And um, we don't know what's going to happen. He was in surgery for six hours and actually removed part of his skull, took the blood clot out, done something with the back of his skull, the top of his neck where it was fractured. And the next I saw him, my dad, he was in bed on a life support machine with half his head shaved off with staples all across his skull. Um, and that was that. So there I am. I've got this, this, my dad is dying in front of me. I've got two coppers next to me who somehow knew that I was ex-job. I hadn't been out of the job long, eight months. Mm -hmm. It might have been the way I was talking about, I, I don't know, they, they knew I was ex-job. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, my dad's going to die or not. And there I am. So I spend the night at Adam Brooks with my mum in like, um, they have like a, an accommodation block there for, for the relatives of the people that are seriously ill or about to die. Mm -hmm. And they say that if you're in the NCU, in, in yeah, the neurocritical care unit, NCCU, that doctors have managed to interrupt your death, whether it's temporary or not, we don't know, but that's how, how poorly my dad was. And I, you know, I'm not a particularly religious man, but I prayed every minute I had that he'd survive. Mm. Because I love my dad. Despite what happened in the park, I love my dad, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he did survive. Um, but at the, at the same time, when he when he came back round again, he was a different man. He couldn't talk. Mm. He spoke when he did speak. It was very robotic. It literally sounded like Siri, you know, on your on your iPhone. Yeah. Um, and there were so many mental deficits. Couldn't think straight. He had the memory of a goldfish. Mm. He was aggressive. He was in a secure unit. Um. Now, what I didn't realise then, what I do now, is that when you have a severe brain injury, if you're lucky enough to survive that, when you do regain consciousness, there's a good chance you're going to be in something called post-traumatic amnesia, which is where your brain, it's a bit like your hard drive's been scrambled and it's trying to reboot itself. So yeah. everything was confusing. He didn't know me, he didn't know my brother, he couldn't talk. He felt like he was actually at Adam Brooks because he worked there. So mm -hmm. he was around the wards, rubbing people's names off the boards and stuff, and patting the doctors on the back, telling them to keep up the good work and come and see if they've got any problems. It was like, it, it, it absolutely, it was a bit like, you know, when you fire up a diesel generator to produce energy, but it doesn't really do anything, it just sits there and runs. Mm. That's what dad, he was just living. He wasn't doing anything. Um, and he gradually improved and he went to a, a rehab center in Norwich. Now, during this time, my garden leave had finished. And I now start this new job in London again mm. with FF, where I'm now starting to deal with big clients. Yep. So I'm dealing with big, big groups, um, national accounts. And I've got to, got to go and be on my A game for this new job. But at the same time, I'm getting calls from the doctors, calls from the hospitals. My dad somehow gets a phone and keeps ringing me and asking me the same question over and over again because he's forgotten the answer. Mm -hmm. And then he's forgotten why he's rung me. Then he's forgotten who I am. Um, and that was a terrible time. Um, do you, did you, did you, so you, at this period, I'm assuming, are you still thinking about the police? Because you end up going back, right? Yeah, I did. So, yeah, I am still thinking about the police, but I didn't have time to think about it because my, yeah. my low mood and my 
um, I suppose the beginnings of depression all of a sudden got amplified overnight with the stress of dad because not only had this injury with my dad um, rendered him with this huge deficit, it also rendered him homeless. Mm. Because at the time he, he was renting a room with my great uncle, my dad's uncle, who had dementia. So dad was a part-time carer for him as well. So I had my, mm. my uncle who had dementia that needed to be looked after and my dad that was homeless and in hospital and you needed to somehow find some sort of accommodation for him. I had a job that I just started again. It was quite high pressure. I had two young kids and a wife that I still had to be present for at home. It was really mm. a difficult time. Yeah. But thankfully, over the months, dad improved. He got better. And we were able to get him to a point where he could just about live independently. Mm. But I couldn't then cope with KFF again. I, I couldn't. It was too much. I couldn't cope with the pressure of sales. And mentally, I was just not there at all. I was to, I'd go to London and I'd be I'd walk around in the days for eight hours, find different churches to sit in and mm. just sit there and then go home again. That's mm. what I was paid to do. It's terrible. Um so when so did you rejoin the police? I did when did I rejoin the police? Yeah, so obviously you've you've you can't you fed up with this sales job again. Yeah. When did you end up rejoining the police? So I I go into a local butcher in Colchester that I'm quite friendly with. He was a butcher that I used during my stint on television. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> stint on television makes me sound like a celebrity when I took part <laughs> in that, yeah. that, um, that, that show the years ago. Adrian, his name, he, bless him, he's passed away now, but he was a really good friend of mine. And I said to him, I said, I've got this idea where I, I want to start buying in lumps of cheese in wholesale and selling them. Mm -hmm. And he said, great idea. He goes, why don't you leave what you're doing? He goes, in the background. He said, use my butcher shop as a base. Mm -hmm. He said, start up a business here. It will do it together. And we'll, sh we'll ship out your products on my vans. And it keeps you local and quite close to your dad. I thought, great idea. I've got nothing to lose. I'm, I'm broken already. Fuck it. So I did. So uh, I left KFF um, because I, did need, I needed to be closer to dad. Because at that point, my brother wasn't driving. I was the only one with the car. Mm. Um, and someone had to care for dad. So um, I started a business called Chops, which mm -hmm. was... Um, butchery and charcuterie supplies, mm -hmm. chops. And it went mad. I, I was just selling steak, chicken, cheese, butter, olive oil. I, I started by proxy a, a small wholesale business and I was picking up all the local garden centers and I was turning over a couple of grand a week doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was going through Adrian's business and the, everything. But it was hard because it soon transpired that Adrian wasn't the businessman I thought he was. In fact, he wasn't a businessman at all. The, the, the butcher shop was about a hundred and something thousand pound overdrawn. Mm. Uh, he was owed money left, right and centre. The way it was run was abysmal. Um, and this brand that I built, this, this chops business, mm. um, was going well, but there was no longevity there. Because I also then had a another little business that I was putting together called Meat for Your Muscles, which was, you know, you've got um, My Protein, I think they call they sell butcher's packs or whatever it's mm -hmm. called. I was doing the same thing locally, Meat for Your Muscles. Okay. And I was putting together, because back in them days, I was quite big into the gym. Mm -hmm. I get the meat hampers. And I was struggling to get product, prices all over the place, and suppliers were putting us on stock because he hadn't paid his bills. Um, and, at, and at this point, Dad was becoming hard work again because he was starting to get a bit more independent um, and going out, drinking, which would then amplify his brain deficit, getting in fights, 66, 67 years old. And I thought, I can't, I need something to focus on. The only place that I found where I could lose myself was the police service. I'd been, about, I'd been out about 18 months by now. Yeah. So it was then I rejoined the police. I said to Lauren, look, I'm broken. I need to. I, I I need to fix something, and I'm. I need to fix this kind of yearning I've got to get the person back that I was. Looking back now, the truth is, I used the place to get away from my problems. I used it to. I had an excuse not to be around dad too much. Mm. I had an excuse to let nature take care of itself with him. Mm. Uh, I had an excuse not to answer the phone. Mm. I had an excuse to switch the phone off. I didn't because I'm a police officer. I'm, I'm doing something. Yeah. So whilst I I yearned to go back to the job. Um, I 
I, I can tell you now, looking back, it was a get out clause for me. It was for me to go and bury my head in the sand a bit. Mm. Um, and so I rejoined and um, Suffolk police were accepting rejoiners. And I walked in and the, and the inspector that interviewed me was, um, was, had been the training school inspector when I left, who knew me and said, oh, you're back then. Right. Off you go. <laughs> and that. Yeah, within, within a month, I was back in uniform again and, and, wow. and unbelievably back on my old shift line as well. Amazing. And in that period, because the total, you're, you've been in the job a total of 10 years. You've yeah. left, left after three. You've gone back, obviously, for a, a further eight, seven-ish. Yeah, yeah, seven and a half. Seven and yeah. half yeah. Um, so where in that period, in the seven and a half years, did it start to change for you again? Because obviously, you know, we'll go into your, your success in your business shortly. But, you know, when did it start to change for you in the job when you start actually something's not right here so it wasn't what was going on at home i think by by now by this time laura had kind of resigned herself to the fact that it's kind of what i was going to do mm -hmm. um and it, it wasn't there's no pressure at home really um mm -hmm. i started to display symptoms of ptsd but i didn't realize it so I was starting to really struggle with sleep. I'd get sleep anxiety. Where was this caused by anything in the job or was it outside the job? Not that I was aware of at the time, but I still had problems with dad. Mm -hmm. um, I still had all of that baggage from my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and the older I got and I kind of, I suppose, the longer I was a parent, the more these feelings that I'd swallowed down were starting to reemerge again. Mm. Um, but the job triggered them. Mm. So the job triggered them and I was starting to normalize trauma a bit too much um and I was struggling to sleep I mean I I'd have a night shift and I'd maybe get two or three hours in between my next night shift and go and do another night shift on top of that mm. um and of course your health suffers <clears throat> mm. your friendships your relationships suffer I was hard work to be around but I was still job pissed mm. I was still job pissed but as the time went on my sleeping issues got worse and worse and worse i started to get terrible ibs um i wasn't eating well i was drinking too much not drinking to get pissed but drinking to get to sleep yeah yeah, 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 yeah. i'd get sleepy i'd not like you yeah um but then that has the kind of opposite effect because you don't sleep well when you've got a couple of beers inside you so you wake up again and you're tired again and, and um yeah i I suppose I'd got about three years back in and then we had Ruby, uh, my, my, my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of changed thing, switched things on, on its head. We weren't expecting Ruby. Ruby was a, a little surprise. It still is pocket rocket now. <laughs> um, but I was really struggling with, um, I think just life as a police officer. And I was slowly starting to fall out of love with that job. What kind um, of things? What kind of things inspired that in terms of falling out in love with the job? Was it, you know, the, the the culture, or was it just the shifts, or just the people you're dealing with? What was it for you? Everything, all of them, and more. Um, the culture, the politics. I, I worked in a small station, and I was starting to see lots of bitchiness, backstabbing, shit spreading. And it never failed to amaze me that we, here we are, we're a collection of police officers that deal with everyone else's problems, but we can't deal with our own. Mm. Uh, lots of really pathetic playground antics, you know, and that started to grind me down. <clears throat> I'm quite an absorbent person. I, I absorb atmospheres and that I'm in. And if something's quite negative, it, it grinds it, it grinds me down. Mm -hmm. um, the hours were starting to kill me. I was getting older. I wasn't sleeping. Um, in Suffolk on a Friday, Saturday, if you do a late shift, you do what's called a late late. So it's if you're on response, it's from a five in the afternoon to four in the morning, and then five in the five in the afternoon the following day to four in the morning, and then back into two night shifts. Now, so for me, for effectively that was four night shifts, and I wasn't sleeping in between. Yeah, it's killing me. Um, still, I still didn't have a job, mm. but it started to kill me. Yeah, I was starting to display symptoms that I now know were the was the beginning of PTSD. But back then, I just put it, the IBS down to poor diet, yeah. the, the the lack of sleep, just down to oh, I must be an insomniac. This must be what it is. Yeah. I started to get a skin condition called psoriasis. Mm. 
hereditary, but really aggravated by stress. Yeah. I'll just put it down to just one of them things. Granddad had psoriasis, so it just must be what I've got, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just wasn't sleeping. And quite often I come into work, I'd be so tired, I get sent home again because I just could not function. Mm. So I went on to, I had a chat with my, my duty governor, duty inspector, and I went on to the SMT, um, Safe Neighbourhood Team, which was seven shifts on and three off. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was no nights. But then it didn't make things that much better because all of a sudden I was working seven days instead of six. Mm. Uh, it's only days and late. So actually I've got less time at home and I'm doing 70 hours a week in a, in a, in a block. Um, and my symptoms were getting worse and worse. And then we had a, a change in inspector. And bear in mind, the station I was in, which was Sudbury, which is a small market town in Suffolk, it's a lovely little town, but it's got some real big drug problems. There's a train line into that town. There's always an active, at least one active county line in that town. Mm. And because we were right on the edge of the county, it wasn't getting the attention from our TSD groups, from our drug, from our drug teams, from our Sentinel teams. It was kind of very much a local problem dealt with by local bobbies. Mm. Um, and the, the new governor picked me and a good mate of mine, Ollie, to to head up this, he called us the proactive enforcement team, but it was two of us, <laughs> two of us on his proactive enforcement team. And I remember he said, he goes, I want you two to get rid of the county lines out of this town, which was great. Me and Ollie, were, we were both, um, we, we, we'd worked together on and off for years. We were really best mates at work. We police very similar, both very proactive officers. Um, and we, our stop search results were good. We were getting good results, um, some good arrests, some good jobs. And so we're like, yeah, lovely. Thank you, boss. We'll do that. Um, what we didn't anticipate was what the boss had done was kind of created this role, created this team without getting it signed off properly by the powers to be, without mm-hmm. advertising the role so other officers could have applied for it. He just said, right, there you go, you two. Off you go, bosh. Mm-hmm. So that then caused a lot of discontent mm-hmm. at the station for people that then thought Ollie and I were on a jolly, mm-hmm. um, which made things really hard for us. Um, because then the politics starts, and, and then and then the, the I probably want to say systematic bullying, the rumours, the yeah. the crap that gets spread, and you know we'd be called Inspector Horton, you know, we'd be called the Horton's Golden Boys, and it was really it used to get back to us, and then because there's people who had their noses put out of joint, then the rumours start, and and I had a friend on response, really close friend of mine back then. But he actually suffered from PTSD as well. And he's also a very strong personality. And then another individual decided to start, thought they'd have a little game and see if they could play one off against the other. And because Lloyd, my friend Lloyd had these issues and I had these issues, you can imagine it's like the perfect storm. And we mm. had this huge falling out. Mm. Um, and it was at this time that I was doing, again, mega hours, working all hours God send. Um, I was not sleeping. I was drinking too much. I was having tummy problems. I was um, emotional. I mean, some days I'll be bursting into tears. Other days I'd want to kill people. Mm. But actually, actually, the, the build-up to a breakdown was happening, but I couldn't recognise it. I couldn't yeah. see it because I was yeah. so driven. My wife could see it. My wife could see it. My teammates could see it. Um, I couldn't. And I, I was almost out of control. I was really quite bad. But I needed to get out of this station because the tension between Lloyd and I was terrible. Um, and it was really much to do about nothing. It was just people causing problems. And there was other personalities in the station that just had an issue with the role that me and Ollie were doing. So I applied for Roads, Police and Firearms, the rap team in Suffolk, and mm-hmm. got the job. I got the job. Um, and part of that is to go on the advanced driving course. Mm-hmm. So, a few weeks later, I find myself at headquarters, staying at headquarters, and um, I'm on the advanced driving course. And that, that course is a fantastic course. That's everyone wants to do the advanced driving course. You know, you, you get pursuit trained, you drive these big super duper BMWs that go really fast, and mm. you're a traffic cop. Yeah. You, you know, you're the bee's knees. You're a traffic cop. Yeah. You know? And again, I was doing it to get away from the shitstorm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was doing it to get away from the shit storm. And I'd, I'd totally lost myself by then. Um, so we start the course and there's me and because Suffolk is kind of a sister constabulary to Norfolk and Suffolk and Norfolk police. 
or Norfolk and Suffolk police, depending on whether you're in Norfolk or Suffolk, um, the, the courses tend to merge. So I was on my driving course with three firearms boys from, from Norfolk. And I started the first week really strong. It's a residential course and I had a really good week, but things weren't clicking into place. So I was, I was driving and I was grinding my teeth and I was getting neck ache because I was so tense and, and I, I wasn't relaxing. And actually where the other boys were starting to improve and progress, I was starting to regress. So my driving was getting worse, really below standard almost. Mm. More, and the worse it got, the more it bothered me, the more I took it to heart. Until the middle of the second week, and we're on the A14, on our way back from Kings Lynn, back to Marbisham Police Headquarters. And I was in a five series BMW, doing in excess of 140 mile an hour on a test run. And <laughs> I just started daydreaming. I was meant to be doing a commentary, and I just started daydreaming. I started talking about fence posts and fence panels. It's mm. ridiculous. And the instructor's like, Walshy, well, you've got to stop, pull over. This is pull over. And we stop. And I said, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what happened there. I said, I can't drive anymore. I'm just going to sit there. I can't do it. And it really got to me that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this, me, who I consider myself to be so switched on and in control of everything and always had an answer to everything, always knew what was going on. I, I really rated myself. All of a sudden, I couldn't cope. I, my mind was, I mean, bloody fence posts. Where does that come from? I'm they. I'm going down the A14 at 140 odd mile an hour and I'm daydreaming about landscaping my garden. It's mm. just not safe. Terrible. So we pull over and I, and I say to Hicksie, the instructor, I said, look, I can't drive. Uh, I, I can't drive. So don't worry, mate. He said, sit in the back. The other chap, Carl, he drove. And yeah, Carl had a really good drive, which then made me feel even worse. And we stopped in Norfolk and we had lunch. Now I was, I was ravenous. I couldn't eat. I couldn't chew. Mm. Couldn't. I felt sick to my stomach, but I was hungry. Yeah. I felt really tired, but I was wired. Um, and I was just willing that day to end. And it mm. did. And we got back to headquarters. And once I was out of that car again, I, was, I, I felt better. Mm. Um, and I bumped into a mate of mine, Tom, who used to be the same nick as me in Sudbury. And he comes up to me and he said to me, oh, well, she, I said, yeah, you're right. He said, hey, you know, it's, it's hard work, isn't it? He said, yeah. He said, what's going on with you and Lloyd then? I said, what do you mean? Mm. He said, look at this text I've got from Lloyd. And it was a text, I can't remember what it was, but it was kind of in a roundabout saying something about this fallout we've had. And it just triggered me. And I was like, oh. So that triggered me off. Anyway, I put it in the back of my mind. And then me and the, me and the other lads went for Nando's. And I was my normal, normal self, normal Walshy, cracking jokes, cracking one liners, being, being one of the boys again. And it got to about eight o'clock. And it's like a, a light switch. I was deathly tired like I'd just come off a night shift. So I made my excuses and I said, look, boys, I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to go back to, I've got to ring the, I've got to ring the wife. She's just missed call. must be important. I'm going to go back to my room and, and ring Lauren, which was utter crap. Lauren hadn't tried to call me. Yeah. I needed to get out of that environment. Yeah. Dragged myself to my digs, got into my, my bed um, in the room at headquarters and, and just fell asleep um, into a real deep but restless sleep. And then at 11 o'clock, I remember it so clearly. A couple of probation officers who were staying there as well come back from the a pub with the black tiles, which is quite close. They've got no pissed. And one of them bumped into my door. And it was that bang that triggered me off. And I jumped out of bed, I jumped out of bed, and it the the rage and the anxiety and the terror were so tangible. I was gonna jump out of that room and kill them. I was gonna mm. so I felt so aggressive. Mm. And then that was it. That that was when it started. That's that it was that point that the wheels totally fell off for me. I sat on the end of my bed and I started to have a panic attack, an anxiety attack that went on for six hours. And my heart was thumping. I had pains in my neck, my mouth was dry, I had pains in my arm. I was convinced I was having a heart attack. Mm. But my ego was such I wouldn't I wouldn't allow myself to call for help. I just remember thinking, if I'm gonna die, this is it. I'm yeah, I was gonna find my in my pants caught up in a ball, and that's it. I'm you know. And then I was trying to meditate to calm down and I couldn't. And then I started to get flashbacks and I was getting flashbacks to the light aircraft crash I'd been to where the guy was burning alive and the flashback was so vivid I could almost smell it. And then the hanging I'd been to the week after that and then the suicide by shotgun I'd been to the week after that. And then all of these jobs that i dealt with but hadn't dealt with personally were coming back. And it's a bit like 
you know, like when you're on a computer and you want to shut it down, but programs are still running. So just you go to shut it down, program will ping up and say, you need to close this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I was dropped off to sleep, my mind would go, boom, you need to deal with this. It'd be another flashback. Mm. Another flashback. Then I started to think about my friend Lloyd that I'd fallen out with. And having these really irrational thoughts, I'm going to go and kill him. I know he's working late. I want to meet him on the way back from work. I want to do him in. Mm. I can't, I'm, I'm going to go and have him. Mm. But then the rational part would be like, mate, you're a copper. You can't think like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, but I was just firing off on all cylinders. I was just going off like mm. a firebox box, just going off. Um, and then it must have got to about four in the morning, five in the morning. It was five in the morning. And I'm just sat on the end of the bed in my pants on my head in my hands. And I had this moment of realisation that I'm having a breakdown. This mm. is what it's like. Mm. I'm not dying. I'm not, I'm not nuts. I'm having a breakdown. And it was almost like once I'd made that realisation, it was like the world lifted off my shoulders and I just collapsed and I cried my eyes out. I cried myself to sleep on the floor. So, Why was that? Was it was, was it almost like an ego thing? Like I just I just couldn't I couldn't tell you, Alex. I just couldn't control it. I mm. cried and I cried and I cried and I just sat there on my own. Because I didn't want anybody to know what was going on, and I, was, I cried myself to sleep like a baby. Um, a 38, 39 year old man curled up in a ball in his pants, crying mm. like a baby. So I fell asleep for, oh, God, by then I was so exhausted because believe it or not, an anxiety attack just takes so much out of you. And I'd been, I'd been going at it for about six hours by then. So um, I woke up at seven. I thought, right, I just need a couple of weeks off. That's all I need, mm. a couple of weeks off and I'll be fine. I'll tell you what I'll do. I thought I'll, I'll go into the driver training school across the yard, just explain them a bit poorly and I won't, I won't drive today. Because that day we were meant to be driving to Melton Mowbray on a check run. So that's a good run there and back from Suffolk. Um, but there's no way I was fit to drive. I'm bloody barely fit to drive myself home. But um, so I, I look at them, I look terrible. I kind of freshen myself up and I go over to the driver, the officers before the lads get there. But I knew that I knew that the um, the instructors were there. And I walked in and they're all there. Like, well, she all right. And I just burst into tears in front of them. I just literally collapsed to my knees and just sat there and cried. Mm. I mean, it's, I mean, you, you know me now. Or, or know mm. me fairly well. That's just not me. <laughs> no, not at all. Absolutely not. And what, what did they do? What did they do when you did what happened? Um, oh, brilliant. Um, a chap called Roy Day, who I'm forever thankful for. He took me to one side, took me to a little room, just sat with me. And he was an ex-traffic cop. And he said, you know, this is common. He said this happens a lot. Mm. And I just just I could I couldn't even tell you really what I was crying about. I was just trying to blub. I was talking about when my daughter was ill and and I was then talking about the, the light aircraft crash and the and the hanging. I just couldn't. I, again, I was far enough like a fireworks box. It was all coming out. Couldn't get my words out. So they made the necessary arrangements, and um, I convinced them I was okay to drive home. And uh, um, I drove, went straight to my friend Dolly's house, mm-hmm. um, who was in the job. I, I just, who was on my team that I just left. Mm-hmm. And I knocked on his door and he's like, well, she, what are you doing here? And I literally just burst into tears on his doorstep. Mm. They went and sat on his sofa. Mm. They were talking about now and he said that when, he, when I turned, he goes, I looked like death behind the eyes. He goes, it just wasn't you. He said, you were just... And then Mr. Horton, the governor, phoned me up and I went and met him. And he said to me, well, she said, just take a couple of weeks off and see how you get on. And that was it. I went home. Mm. And I got back mid-afternoon and I phoned Lauren. I said, Lauren, can you come home? I've I've been sent home from work. I've had a breakdown. So she naturally just dropped everything because Lauren's a teacher, dropped everything, come back home. Yeah. And there I am. And I'm, and that actually was, it got a lot worse before it got, before it got better. And that was the last I heard from the job for a little while. I was on my own. Mm. Did anyone check in on you? Um, only Ollie did. Okay. Ollie did. Sorry, my, my Lexus going. Let me just turn it off. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, Ollie checked in on me. I had nothing from HR. I had nothing from anybody at all. So the following morning, um, Lauren went off to work and the kids went to school and Ruby went off to nursery and I'm left on my own in my house. And um, I'm feeling awful. 
And I'm sat on the end of my bed in tears, again, crying. I just couldn't stop crying. Thumbing through my phone, trying to find the counsellor. I had to do this myself. Mm. Because I phoned... Suffolk Police used to have a thing called Validium, which were... Um, they'd offer you six free counselling sessions if you were struggling. So I'd phone them up, got triaged over the phone, and I'll never forget it. The bloke's words were, sorry, mate, you're too far gone. You need some proper counselling. Wow. And that was that. So... Why, he goes, why don't you get onto the counsellor's directory and have a look? I thought, well, I've got to fucking do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why am I doing that? I'm not, I'm barely getting myself dressed at the moment. You know, so there I am. <clears throat> Everyone's out. I'm thumbing through my phone and I look up and I see the loft hatch. And I think it would be too easy. Too easy to stick something around my neck and hang from that. So, so you, felt you, you had suicidal thoughts? Momentarily, mm-hmm. it the easiest option for me was to do myself. That was the easiest option for me. I couldn't cope with myself. I felt like I was a burden on my family. I felt I was no good to anyone. And I was in a right pickle. Now, in the build-up to this, as I was deteriorating before the actual wheels fell off, my dad had become quite a big trigger for me because as I was starting to go very quickly downhill, a lot of the issues that I'd buried as a child kept coming up and I was ignoring him and I, wasn't, I hadn't seen him for about six weeks and I was getting very short. I, was, I wasn't horrible what I was. I was kind of punishing him, but I, for no mm-hmm. real reason. Um, so he was ringing and I couldn't, I turned him off and I couldn't speak to mum and I'm sat there and I'm thinking, I can... I could do this. And then all of a sudden, and, I, and I, from nowhere, this little voice in my head just went, come on, Walshie, not yet, mate. You're better than that. Don't do that. And it just snapped me back into reality momentarily. Just this little mm-hmm. voice, it, you know, my subconscious just saying, come on, mate, you're better than that. So I managed to find myself a counsellor. I pulled, pulled, pulled my, myself together a little bit, um, managed to get myself a counsellor. And I started an intense therapy um, twice a week, about mm-hmm. six months, dealing with my shit. <laughs> I started to feel a bit better. Um, I started to feel a bit better. And um, one day on the way back from therapy, I thought, I'm going to go and see my dad. So I drove to find my, I drove to my dad and he had a little cottage, a little like rented cottage that he was living in. And he wasn't there. It was a Saturday morning. It was, it was a Saturday morning. I, thought, I know where he'll be. He'll be at the local um, football ground because he'll watch the local team play football because he used to play for that team. Mm-hmm. So I walked there and there he was at the sideline and he looked dreadful. Mm. He looked dreadful. Now, he'd prior to that, he'd had um, a cancer scare. He had a lump in his throat mm-hmm. and um, he... Uh, He'd gone, to the, he'd gone to the doctors and they'd done scans and they'd done biopsies and said, no, Mr. Walsh, you, you're cancer-free. We can't find anything. Um, but he still had this sore throat and it was getting so bad that he couldn't eat. So when I saw him, having not seen him for about six or seven weeks, um, which I, I feel deeply bad about even now, um, he looked awful. He'd lost weight. His skin was grey. And I, I looked at him and I could just see, I could see a man that was dying. Mm. And... Uh, he said, do you want to come back to mine for a cup of tea? But I couldn't do it. I said, no, I can't, Dad. I can't, because I just wasn't well enough. Mm. I wish I'd gone back for that cup of tea now. I really do. But anyway, um, I said, well, what I will do, Dad? I said, um, would you mind? Because Dad was, by now he'd recovered, and he was very independent, my dad was. Mm-hmm. But he still struggled to cope with certain affairs because of his brain deficit. I said, Dad, would you mind if I ring the doctors and just ask them to assess you again? He said, would you mind? So I'll do that for you, Dad. So I come back home and I didn't let on to dad how ill I was. I didn't want to worry him. Yeah. Um, because the bit the sweet thing is, is despite I had all these hangups with my dad, I still loved him dearly. Loved yeah, him yeah. dearly, my dad. Mm-hmm. So I kept home and I, I phoned the doctor and I said, look, I'm Alan Walsh's son. I've really got concerns. I, I, I'm not happy with your diagnosis that he's cancer free. Can we have a, a second opinion? So, yep, they jacked up another MRI scan and the biopsy. And come back, and he had throat cancer. Mm. Of his tongue. So 
they they had a meeting with me and dad that was what they call a, a duty of candle meeting where they basically admit they've copped up and um they're misdiagnosed and the, the doctor the oncologist showed me the scans and she said we didn't pick up the first the radiologist didn't pick up the first one and i looked at the second scan and i could i could look at the first scan from months before and i could see the cancer i said well what's that there she goes well that's that's the cancer that's now the size of a golf ball and it's inoperable and so for your dad to we can't operate on that because if we did we'd have to remove his tongue his voice box and the roof of his mouth so effectively it's inoperable so the only chance your dad has got is intense radio and chemotherapy he's got about a 60 percent chance of survival so there i am all of a sudden i'm 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 done <laughs> that's mm -hmm. it i'm sitting there trying to be strong with my dad and i'm thinking you know you know can life get any worse for me right now you know um and poor old dad i mean dad took it like like a like an absolute i mean i bloke unbelievable i've never seen a man face death with such dignity but he took it and so the treatment begun but um that then sent me over the edge even further uh because at this by this up to this point my ego had said that i didn't need to take antidepressants i could just get away with going to the gym every day doing my weights and and a bit of counseling i'll be fine all of a sudden i'm off the edge mm. and then there comes in the suicidal thoughts again and i'm and i'm thinking i <laughs> can't do this much more can't do this much more so dad start i'd start ferrying dad to him from hospital as well as dealing with my own stuff i have to take poor old dad to hospital for these tests and to get things measured up and i'm walking around and i'm feeding him and i'm I can, i'm seeing this man deteriorate in front of me and i'm still not really sharing with him what i'm going through and i'm trying to I do say to him sometimes, Dad, you don't really understand how we like what's going on with me, but it doesn't matter, you know. Mm. Um, and then one day we're coming back from a hospital and he's just about to go in for an operation. And I said to him, look, Dad, I said, we need to work out what we can do with your finances because whilst you're in hospital having these procedures, um, I need to be able to pay your bills for you. Mm. And he snapped at me because understandably the guy's under the guy's got his own worries you know he's yeah. and i and that just triggers i'll go i lose my shit completely mm. um um embarrassingly out of control i threaten to kill him kill myself i tell him i'm going to drive the car into a wall um i just can't I'm, I'm sweating i'm crying and and poor old dad there he is all of a sudden you know he's dealing with his own the guy's facing death and there he's rubbing on the back telling me i'm going to be all right <laughs> You know, it was, it was really tough time. So anyway, I bring Dad back home, and uh, and I said to Lauren, I said, Look, I said, I've got, I've got to go to the doctors now. So I get myself on a course of antidepressants, and gradually things get better. I'm able to cope more. It takes the edge off a bit, a little bit. <clears throat> but Dad gets worse. Um, so we take Dad in to hospital just before Christmas to have a peg tube fit into his stomach so they can feed him with a pump because. During the course of radiotherapy, his throat would have been so sore that he wouldn't have to swallow. Um, and that's, I pick up dad that morning and say to him, look, you know, let's get to the hospital. And he said, yeah, let's go. And as we leave his house, he said, I'm not going to come back here again. I'm like, I said, of course you are, mate. He said, no, I won't. And he was right. He didn't. Mm. He didn't come back. He, um, the, the radiotherapy aggravated his brain injury. So effectively, he then had to go into a secure unit because he lost his lost his marbles, lost capacity. And because the, the radiotherapy was making him so ill, they had to stop. So basically, he just shriveled and died. And I watched a man shrivel on his deathbed. It was only just over a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, died in May last year, um, wishing he had done so much more with his life and regretting the stuff that he had done. Mm, did that give you a lesson in itself? Yes. Yeah, he had regrets? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 He it passed did. away in, in May. He did. If, if you could see your dad now, what would you tell him? Or ask him? I don't know, Alex. I don't know. Um, there's lots I'd want to say, but not that I'd want to share here, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but... I promised him mm -hmm. 
I promised him that with whatever he left us behind, I'd invest it in myself. Mm. And that's then when I found, found you. So we, yeah, so I remember the conversation we had, you, you rang mm. me initially. It was the most refreshing conversation we had. I can remember it very clearly. Uh, that was before dad died as well, wasn't it? I think it was. You, you actually, I think you said to me, you were wait, you waiting, yeah. the, the, the end's near essentially. And um, I think you were reading my book and you was looking at, you know, some of the things online, a very fresh conversation. And you actually had an idea for, for what you now do, which we'll go into in a second. Yeah. Um, and then you says, I'll be in touch. I'll be in touch after this is all kind of cleared. And I, I hear that, by the way, all the time. You know, my yeah. team hears that all the time from people who are interested in business. Yeah. But let let me think about it. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you kept your word you, and you got back in touch and um, you then joined um, Shift Success without a business idea initially. I did. I did. Yeah. I, yeah. I, so dad, yeah, so dad was dying and I'm, we knew by then that it was just a matter of time. Yeah. And I also knew by then that I couldn't go back to the police. Mm -hmm. And whilst I did, um, I, I knew that I, I couldn't stick out for long. So then I had this kind of mantra that I'd just get fit and get out. And that was mm -hmm. kind of where I was heading then. I'm going to get myself fit. And I'm going to get out of the bloody job. Mm -hmm. um, but I need to focus on my dad. But I need to focus on there's so much to go through first. Yeah. Um, and I was laying in bed one day and I was one night and I'm Googling and I'm starting to feel a bit better now. I'm dealing, I'm dealing with my shit. I'm dealing with dad. The counselling is really working. I'm starting to think clearer. Mm. Albeit I was still having these bouts of aggression and anger that, that I was really struggling to contain. Um, but I'm starting to feel better. I, mean, I can remember I used to go to the local shop in mm. the high street, the next village, and just stand out there and try to eyeball the biggest bloke I could find to see if I could start a fight to get rid of my aggression. Mm. So I, I had so much going on that I was just... And I was turning into a little devil. I really was an awful... But it was subsiding. I was getting better. So I'd Googled, I think I actually Googled police officer entrepreneur. <laughs> and of course, your book crops up. Yeah. Um, and be because I am an impatient so-and-so, I didn't wait to get the free copy that you were sending out at the time. I went and bought it on Amazon yeah. um, and read it and thought, wow, this is, this is good stuff. Mm -hmm. This is good stuff. And some of the stuff I'd kind of had an idea about, there's so much in there, it was so valuable mm -hmm. that... I thought this this is almost too good to be true. I need to start stalking this guy. Yeah. So I was stalking you long before I phoned you. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had that conversation, didn't we? We, and, we did. Uh, and that was, I can tell you now, it was two days after I'd thought about swinging from the rafters. That close? Yeah. Two was there afterwards. I would never have known if we, you know, the call we had. You were so, you know, refreshingly pleasant and... Uh, didn't yeah they're you know, the ones to worry about the ones that don't show yeah, it yeah i would never have guessed seriously i can remember the conversation very very clear mm. um and he was quite do you know what you sound quite positive as well um that's why it was refreshing despite what was going on mm. um he was refreshing about life in general and so I, you know, I needed i needed some hope yeah i was i needed some hope and um i think having what was then a fantasy about maybe being my own boss and being honest with what I need to myself, mm -hmm. give me a little ray of hope. And, and that's what I needed at that time. So, yes, yeah, so we had that conversation, didn't we? And then, and then things went rapidly downhill after that for me. Dad, <laughs> poor dad yeah. passed away. And, and then, of course, you have all the crap that goes on with after that. I had to sort his stuff out. I had to sort funerals out. And no one teaches you mm -hmm. how to do this stuff. No. You know, nobody, nobody teaches you. And then I was going back to, and then I went back to work. I went back to work too early. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm immensely proud of that time as well because I took so much from it. Yeah, lessons. I, I think that's uh, the mindset that you have. I think sometimes people can get swayed towards a victim mindset. You know, why has this happened to me? My dad's died. You know, I'm going through this. You know, why is the people in the job treat me this way? But for you, Mark, what one thing that I've recognized is that what you said, um, you know, in this interview is that you were, uh, you took responsibility, you took ownership. And you realize nothing was going to change without you first creating change. And that's the lesson itself that, you know, I've, I've learned from you that more people need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, nothing, nothing will change until you change nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It will always be the same. That yeah. comfort blank will always be comfortable. Yeah. Until you, until you get comfortable being uncomfortable. Spot um, on. And, you know, I, 
I don't look back, and I, I can say this hand on heart, the experiences I've had over the last five years, personal experiences with mm -hmm. my mental health and with the way I've, I've, things I've experienced with other people, I don't regret any of it. I mm -hmm. don't wish it had never happened. I don't reproach myself because it was the making of me. Yeah, it's carved you into the man you are today. The making of me. Mm -hmm. And it gave me that time to slow down, to become more insightful, mm -hmm. to learn, to learn from other people, to change my social circles. And the, the change for me really started the day I phoned you back up and said, Alex, <laughs> I'm ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then, yeah, I joined Shift yeah. Success. You Signed did. You did. You, you, so you joined Shift Success and actually you, we worked together and you loved coaching. You was obviously reading lots yeah. of books at the time. You was developing your mindset. You, you knew, you realized that that was of high priority for you. And obviously, I, you know, that's obviously helped you become the person you are today. Um, and you wanted to use that coaching in a business, right? And do you want to share with everyone what your initial idea was when we started working together? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think when we first spoke, I remember the conversation with, with you, really clearly because yeah. i'd sort of said to you look I'm, I'm i'm doing i'm doing all right now and uh, and i was i was doing i was doing well yeah um and i remember saying i really want to use my experiences to to help people mm -hmm. um, and we decided between us didn't we that maybe i'd be a, a a coach for for broken men that come out of broken relationships and yeah and and men that have been cheated on and 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 so yeah i started doing that and and during that time i was doing a lot of study and i i started an nlp course i'd um I was getting my head around coaching. It was a whole new industry to me. Um, and it started off pretty well for me, I think. Um, although I, I struggled to nail my niche to begin with, I still managed to pick up a few clients. Yeah. Become a guest coach on a, on a mental health platform. I don't know how I managed to do that, but I got invited to do that. Um, and ended up, ended, up on a, ended up doing a coaching program with, some American, with an American doctor called Dr. Sherry, who was a, a really highly qualified psychologist in America. And I'm just talking about my life experiences and we're co-hosting this program, this six part program. Um, got invited on podcasts and going really well, but I couldn't get to grips with the longevity of that niche for me. So whilst I felt that I was quite current at the time. What did you find in that niche? What kind of, what, cause, cause we were, we joined some Facebook groups, right? Yeah, and we found a lot of men were quite really annoyed with what had happened to them, right? And it was oh, borderline, you know, a bit malicious. It was pretty bad, wasn't it? Some of the, I think, between us, didn't we? We joined a couple of groups that, for, for divorced men, and it was, it was just a holding pen for savages. I think there were so many people in there that were just really bitter and really um, uncoachable people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so then I then pivoted. I pivoted my idea slightly, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll then start helping men professional men that are struggling with work stress and kind of they would almost mirror my experiences to a degree mm -hmm. but you know and again start to pick up some some good connections start to try and sell the idea i never really want to fully pay me <laughs> <laughs> um but again it was going when well, i was making a lot of content i was getting some really good feedback and and, and really sort of get my name out there but i started to lose momentum and i didn't have the urge to pick it back up again. I just, it just didn't feel right for me. Mm. Didn't feel right for me. So then um, I kind of sat down and thought and very much quickly realized that the most successful coaching client I ever had was myself. Mm. Because during that time of dealing with other people's problems and coaching other people, I was still coaching myself into this mindset I've got now of go out and get it, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, um, and then I had a complete, Switch and I complete pivot. You did, and, and turn. it yeah. was. Do you know what? Sometimes you know when I speak to our members and the pivot that happens, there is a bit of uncertainty that people have naturally, right? It's like, oh, you know, is this the right direction? Hence why we're conversations. You were like, this is the fucking route I'm gonna go, and you said it was so certainty. It was almost like someone had plopped this vision in your head. And you just knew with absolute certainty. You just knew, and you went hell for level with it. Yeah. We'll talk about your results in a second. You you went, excuse me, you know, balls deep on it. You went, there's no fucking around, and you went for it. Yeah. There's no tiptoeing around this. And it almost like the previous idea slingshotted you into what you've now built. And, you know, do you want to share with people 
you know, what you now do. I think you've got a phenomenal company and you're doing very, very well. Do you want to share with people what you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the owner and founder of a business called The Lawnologists. And uh, we, we base ourselves on bespoke lawn care packages. So what makes us different really is that um, I'm very organic based and I work on the soil as, as much as I do the grass. Well, other lawn care companies will sort of just launch some synthetic fertilizer on some lawns and hope for the best. I tend to have more of a consultative approach. And the end result is a, is a lush, thick green lawn that's weed and moss free. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I'm really proud of my brand and I'm really proud of the company. It's phenomenal. We've got a lovely, uh, you've got a lovely van now and you know, yeah. you've got generating customers, five-star reviews. Um, in, in, you know, do you want to share with people uh, in the period? So how long has this law knowledge has been up and running in total now? <laughs> I had my first sale on the 15th of June this year. And that and was... What, um, what was that for? That was for weed control on someone's driveway. And that was £63. That was £63. Of, you always remember your first, Mark. Yeah, £63. Yep. And I managed to upsell um, another weed control treatment and got it to about £99. I was absolutely over the moon because only 100 quid, but I was in business. I was in business. Um, yeah. And I'd built so much up to that point i've gone and got myself some other mentorship industry specific coaching yeah um from uh i mean that that was a that was a bloody good stroke of luck as well um mm. if, I, if i can quickly share how that came about yeah yeah of course yeah um so the lawn care idea i'd had when i was off ill yeah prior to I th actually i think our first conversation i'd mentioned you mentioned it you did mention it yeah and, and how that came about was that i'd um the way I was trying to deal with my, with my shit, mm -hmm. I started landscaping my garden. I grew my lawn. And I was so proud of, of my grass mm -hmm. that I think, I think men get to an age where their lawn becomes everything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I kind of reached that age in my late days where I live for my lawn. But I was so pleased with it. I thought, oh, I could make a business out of this. And, um, and so I started to look at franchises, but very quickly I didn't, there was, several things that were common with all the franchises that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. One was the branding. I thought it looked too cutesy and too cartoon-like. Yeah. Um, there's, there's some big names out there and I hate their branding. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry if anyone's listening to this, but it doesn't make yeah. sense. Um, I didn't like the fact that I had to give my profits away every month. Yeah, due to them being a franchise, right? Yep, yeah, being a franchise. I didn't like the fact that I was controlled on demographic. Yeah. I didn't like the fact that I'd be controlled on service, what mm. I offer. Yeah. So I didn't want I didn't want to invest in a in all of that and spend 20 grand doing that. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't find I couldn't find anyone that would train me as an independent, as an independent mm -hmm. business. So I emailed the UK Lawn Care Association, mm -hmm. which is uh, the UK Lawn Care Association is um, uh, a body that kind of regulates the independent lawn care business. It's, it's really well recognized. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the UK Lawn Care Association now. It's a mm -hmm. really good injury specific organization to be part of. Yeah. So I emailed and I, and I said, you know, can you help me recommend to me anybody that does um, one to one training for lawn care business? And as it happened, the president of the UK Lawn Care Association was doing one to one training. So I actually managed to find myself an industry leader that gave me one to one training. Amazing. On, on, on the mechanical and cultural side of the business that the things that I couldn't have got from shift success, you see. Yeah. 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 So all, all of a sudden I've got, I'm so lucky really. I had, I had you guys at shift success coaching me, giving me mentorship, talking to me about the back office stuff and how to market my business and how to brand my business and going through the modules. Yeah. And then I'm trotting off to Cambridge and I'm meeting with the president of the UK law and care association. And he's talking me through products and chemicals and yeah. organics and yeah. machinery and and there I am and I can merge the two in the middle yeah and there's my business I love it there's my business love it sweet and that's how the lawnologist was born phenomenal and, and you know you you sort of sales at sixty five pound whatever it was yeah um, which is humble beginnings for for the period you've been in business so far how long you've been in in the lawnologist should I say how long has that been running now about three months three months three months and What's your total sales in just three months? So the first month was about 1,300 quid. The second month was about 2,000 something. August was about 5,000. 
And then I left the police. So I resigned by then. I left the police. You resigned the police, yeah. And I've been in the business full time now for 23 days. <laughs> and so far this month, I've secured for the year an extra £9,700 worth of business. Wow. Absolutely. How, how'd you, I mean, you know how my thoughts about you and how proud I am. And so, about, you know, our, you know, members, the community, how do you feel that you've created this, you you've built this business, you've, you've took the decision to leave the police mm. and now your income, you know, in, in, you know, in a matter of months really is, is outweighing the police. I can't believe it. Mm. I can't believe it that this time three months ago, I was knackered, drinking flat whites and a lay-by in a beaten up police car, mm. wishing that I was out of the police. But what I'd done is I'd created, because let's not let's not forget the lawologist wasn't even a thing until April. No, I can remember, it yeah. It wasn't even a thing. At March, I'm I'm I'd emailed you and said I'm at red. Yeah. Uh, I've had enough. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Two weeks later, the, the lawologist is a thing. The name is a thing. Yeah. Um and I'm working towards this. And if you think about it, from April to April to what we now, September, that's five months. Yeah. I can remember sharing you, 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 when you was on, you know, you was thinking about business names. I can remember yeah. sharing like, the community and we all kind of inputting in that. So I made it very clear. It was, you know, it seems like yesterday, to be well, honest. I can remember your suggestion as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was it? Well, Mark's Lush Lawns, I think it was. Or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's why I'm not a branding expert, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, the law knowledge has come from a friend of mine that had a had a mate used to make cocktails, and used to yeah. call himself the mixologist. So I love it. I kind of just bastardized that and put lawns in front, um, and now trademarked it, so no one can make it. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Hey, um, Mark, what's you know a lot of cops we speak to, or, or people watching this, or listening on the podcast. Mm want what you've got in terms of you know you, you're free from the job you've got this business that's thriving um and you're obviously in a, you know you seem in a much happier place and um, we'll go on to kind of the, the mindset differences in a second yeah. but um s- lots of cops i speak to they feel like i haven't got the skills i haven't got the skills i haven't got the you know i'm just a cop i can't how could i do this w- what advice would you give to those people thinking that don't believe you, sir. Don't believe that. Don't believe mm. that for one minute. The, the biggest thing for me, and I'm probably going to go a little bit coachy now, but the yeah. biggest thing, and it was a mantra that I always used to ram into everyone, is your, your desire to change has to be greater than your desire to stay the same. Mm. You have to have that desire. And when you've got that desire, you soon realize that once you change it, so when, when you get that desire, when your mindset changes, you soon realize that there's countless opportunities out there yeah. and there's so much you can take from your time in the police service to apply to any business idea you want you you carry a unique set of skills you have a unique presence you have a a unique air about you you can apply to anything as a police officer mm. but the problem is is in the place you very quickly become institutionalized and you have almost um your thinking is almost regulated to be yes or no black or white on mm. off and you know, you're, there's no leeway, but actually there's a bigger world out there. Mm. A far bigger world and far more opportunity than you could ever realise. So don't believe the monkey on your shoulder telling you can't do it because you can. Mm. You can. Great advice. No, I completely agree. A, um, well, what's some kind of mindset differences that you've experienced now? Obviously, you've been through this massive journey of your own personal development, going through the ups and downs, through PTSD to depression, to suicidal thoughts, mm. to now being the captain of your own fate, living life on your terms. How do you now feel genuinely? How do I feel now? I feel good. I feel good. I feel creative. I feel energized. I feel unstoppable, if I'm honest. I love it. And don't get me wrong, that there's days where you think, fuck's sake. It's fucking impossible. That's being like but, a human, right? Because we all. But have. that's that's the point. Yeah, that is life. Mm. Nothing's per- nothing's perfect. Mm. It's never a bed of roses. Mm. Because if it did, I'd get bored. I'll be bored very quickly. Moving on again. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. But to be able to tap into that part of me that's that creative, 
that energetic kind of go-getter person that I was all them years prior to being in the police is the most amazing. I feel like I've got my life back. It sounds, it sounds really cliche and it sounds really cutesy, but I'm back in the driver's seat again. Yeah. The absolute shitstorm for the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. I'm back in the game. Do you feel like, you know, we talked about your identity as a police officer. Do you feel like now you're back to who you are as a person and that identity is gone? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know what? When I left the police the first time, um, I really, I still identified myself with Mark, who was a cop and should still be a cop. Yeah. I struggled with that. That was my, because that was everything I, I strived, I aspired to be. My mindset has changed around so much that since leaving on the 17th of August, we're going mm -hmm. off yeah. to celebrate, I have not given that job a second thought. Wow. That's now, it's not. It's not because I'm anti job. Mm. It's not because I don't like it. But it was my time to go. And I would still recommend anybody join the police mm. if it's the right time for them, because you do pick up some immense experiences that you'll never get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. you pick up some immense skills. You get a confidence. You get the ability to be able to talk to people. You get the ability to manage conflict and difficult people. Mm -hmm. These are all things you can apply to business. Mm -hmm. But so I recommend anybody to go, but I think. These days, I would say to people now, if you're going to join, join with your eyes wide open because it's not a job for life. Mm, it's changed, right? It's not, it was, not but now it's changed. Anymore. Yeah. Not, you know. Mm. Did you, um, you know, whilst you was in the job, did you make the decision to come out the pension before? So there was no kind of shackles on you, so to speak? Because a lot of people, yes, are, they, they want to leave. They, they wish they could, but oh no, the pension and they worry about that. Did you yeah. make the decision to come out first? Um, yes, I did. So what I did <laughs> through joining through joining Shift Success and and working with you, I learned about investing. So I then invested in invested in investing success, which is a which was a whole new world to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I went in for this specific module about index funds mm -hmm. um, because I wanted something. I wanted to be doing even if I couldn't afford to pay myself a full pension, paying a full pension just yet. I wanted to learn about investing because I want to build something. Yeah. Um, so that gave me a bit of confidence then to come out of the, the pension. Now, mm -hmm. I had to be careful how I played it because I'd been off work for six months. Mm -hmm. I'd gone back and I was still struggling with sleep. But I was still struggling with PTSD symptoms because when I was getting overtired towards the end of my set, mm -hmm. I would then the symptoms would slowly start coming back again. The, the, the agitation, the irritability, the forgetfulness. All yeah. of these look that I now know are the telltale signs. So I needed to drop a day mm -hmm. anyway. So actually, as I was starting my journey into business, dropping a day it worked nicely for me. So I dropped, I dropped one, my last late shift every set. Mm -hmm. I went down from pro rata to 40 hours a week to about 34. And then I come out of the pension. So actually, what happened there was that my take home pay didn't change, believe it or not. Okay. I was still clearing. What would be twenty one fifty a month, twenty two hundred a month? Great. Coming out the pension and dropping a day, it balances itself out. Yeah. The other benefit of doing that was I didn't have any excuse to stay in the police anymore. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't have that. You know, when you have an idea and that monkey on your shoulder goes, "No, mate, you have got your pension, good pension." Because everyone thinks this pension's brilliant. Everyone thinks it's it's a keeper. But is it a worthy investment? when the job fucks you up so much that you're not going to really enjoy your pension at the end of it anyway, is it really? Is it... Yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm completely agree. I think the investment on the return. I don't think it does. No, no, not um, at all. It's not a good payoff. Um, so yeah, it worked well for me. So I dropped the day, come out of the pension. So it was then giving me six days on, which was still hell and hard work. And then I was getting four days off and then six days on and five days off. And that was in those five, four and five days off, I then started to go and get my training for from from um pro lawn care the um president of the uk lawn care association richard salmon mm -hmm. and i was able to go and source machinery go and get my van get my branding sorted get my paperwork done mm -hmm. i was also very lucky because i used other colleagues from shift success to help me with my branding mm -hmm. so it was all very very tight it was all yeah. very tight and in control and that's something that i'm really grateful of because there's some really talented people in our community yeah really there is people and um, 
it allowed me, and that's how I accelerated launching the business so quickly. I literally, my days off, I'd, I'd made that, that mental commitment that I was going. And then from April up until August, it was nonstop. And I'd got myself so busy with work. Mm-hmm. Had I not left the, left the job in August, I wouldn't have had a day off until November. So mm-hmm. I, you get to a point where you've either got to be all in yep. or all out. Yeah. But you have to, at some point, back yourself and, and take the plunge. It's great advice. I love it. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. Hey, what's the, what's the, what's, you know, Laura just is in, in its infancy, you know, you're making all this, you know, customers and sales. What's your vision for the future? And, you know, you don't have to go into lots of detail, but what kind of some of the insights that you want to build for your company? Yeah, there's, there's a, there's a few actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the lawn care business in its early, in its infancy is quite a seasonal, quite a seasonal business mm-hmm. because the last couple of months, I've been flat out doing lawn renovations. Dare I say it, the drought has done my business a favour. It's ruined everyone's garden. Mm-hmm. Lawns aren't coming back. So people are coming to me to do soil samples and pH tests. And and because I only use all organic feed, mm-hmm. that, that tends to be a, a nice little USP that I hadn't even considered before, but people yep. buy into quite nice. It's, it works really well because it conditions the soil as well. Mm-hmm. So... I've always, I'm always thinking a few steps ahead and at the same time trying to stop myself from getting too ahead of myself. So it's quite it's trying to find that balance. But um, I can see the business going in a, in a few directions. One, I'd like to become a multi-van operation or potentially a franchise. Mm-hmm. But my way, not... Yeah. yeah. I, I want to offer more to people that decide to work with me. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to take the lawn knowledge just online. So for people that want a nice lawn, mm-hmm. but don't want the intrusion of having a lawn care technician come to their address, or they haven't got the funding to pay for a year's package, mm-hmm. then I'd quite like to take the business online, do a consultancy online, and then put together a year's package for them and post it to them so they can mm-hmm. do it. Um, and the other opportunity is potentially training. Train people to do what I've done. Amazing. On a one-to-one thing. And I don't know how that... I think in in that, guys, I'd probably like to probably revert back a bit to my coaching experience mm-hmm. and maybe offer the opportunity to ex-police officers, army veterans, fire service, nurses, mm-hmm. and and try and help people. I, I've got, I'm big on helping people. I love helping people. Thing your blood, isn't it? You can, you can mm. see that from, I mean, from your coaching, from the being a police officer. Mm. Um, I think it's great. I think it's great. I can't wait to you know, spoil you with that. Um, Mark, what kind of motivates you to live your best self right now? You know, what, what's that kind of one thing for you that really gets you out of bed in the morning to really make a go at this? It's, Quite simple, really. It's my legacy. Mm. I leave behind. Watching, watching my dad shrivel, literally shrivel from a man that was stocky and muscular and strong even in his 60s to this, I was going to sound horrible, this little carcass of a body with a big head. Mm-hmm. How cancer just eats away at you. Mm-hmm. Wishing he'd done so much more and leaving us with the memories we're left with. Some very good. Some and some very, very bad. Mm-hmm. When I'm on my deathbed and I've got, hopefully, my family around me, my wife, my children, it's about me going, knowing that I've done all I can for them I and that. having no regrets. And I'm, t- I'm telling you, Alex, to, to anyone, to you, timing is of the essence. Mm. You always, You never know what's around the corner and i've experienced that too many times so when you never know what's around the corner don't let time hold you back get on with it i love that mark hey um mark um where can people find out about your business and you know you know learn more um yep so i've got a website which is uh the lawnologist.co.uk um my instagram is at the lawnologist and then my facebook page is unbelievably the lawnologist <laughs> um and you can find me on uh, and on linkedin on my personal um my personal um profile which is mark walsh um and you can tell it to me because there's a big uh lawnologist banner in the background 
um, you can find me in, on all sort of most social media platforms. Amazing. And one of the last questions that I love to ask every single person who joins the show is for you, Mark, what does entrepreneurship mean for you? Say freedom. Everyone says freedom, but it's so true. It's freedom, but it's that ability to create and nothing holding you back. I'm, I'm really big on creativity. That nothing's stopping you but yourself from creating something that works. And I think that freedom and creativity are the two key things for me. And that's what it means to me, be my own boss. Mark, absolutely amazing. Um, I just want to say um, this has been a two hour um, podcast. And I've oh, absolutely, sorry. I, I, I <laughs> no, I've absolutely <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed it. I just want to thank you for being so raw, authentic, genuine, vulnerable. Um, what you shared with all of us tonight and all the podcast and the people who you know got thousands of downloads now mm. um, is a, you know, is a, is a, is a person who's through a lot of shit, who's had the ups and the downs, who's been there for his family, who have learned lessons along the way, had massive amounts of resilience, um, who's been through those down moments where, you know, you've been thought about taking your own life and yet mm. standing here as a man who's gained his freedom, who's there for his family, who has, you know, basically developed and created his own future for many, many years to come. And I have no doubt that you're going to leave a legacy uh, for your family um, when you are on your deathbed. Um, so Mark, I just want to say how proud I am of you. I generally mean that myself, the team are, I know the community are as well. And um, I can't wait to see your business explode over the next few years. Thank you, mate. Very kind. And, and actually, while well, I've got you, thank you. Because I don't think you'll ever quite realise or appreciate exactly what Shift Success did for me. And and uh, when I see you next, I'll give you a big cuddle. All right? <laughs> I'll give you a big cuddle. I'll give you definitely a big cuddle. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. And uh, guys, for everyone watching, I'm going to leave this inside the Facebook group. The um, interview will be up on YouTube. Um um, maybe early next week and also we'll get this on the podcast so you can listen um, by audio as well mark thank you so much again for sharing your journey and uh, guys we'll see you all soon thank Take you care. Care. cheers alex cheers